Hello, I am Paul K. DiCostanzo, co-host of the AD History Podcast. At the request of the United States Center for Disease Control, I've been asked to share with you this public service announcement. COVID-19, better known as coronavirus, has spread throughout the world. Symptoms of this respiratory disease may include fever, cough, and shortness of breath. These symptoms may show up 2 to 14 days after exposure. If you are experiencing these symptoms and have come in contact with or are in an area with an ongoing outbreak, please call a hotline and or consult a physician. Clean and disinfect high-touch surfaces. For more information, please visit cdc.gov COVID-19. Thank you. And now to your regular broadcast of AD History. Have you ever wondered how Buddhism entered China or how the Romans perceived comets? Well, have we got a story for you. This is the AD History Podcast, weaving a tapestry of world history from 1 AD to HD, powered by TGNR. Get your good news that's real news at TGNR by visiting tgnreview.com. Now here are your hosts, Paul K. DiCostanzo and Patrick Foote. And brought to you via London and New York City, you are listening to the AD History Podcast. I am Paul K. DiCostanzo, and I'm joined by my co-host, Patrick Foote. Patrick, how are you holding up in these <laughs> uncertain times? Uh, I'm, I'm holding up okay. Uh, as people may or may not know, uh, my recording area where I work is in a basement. It's in the basement of where, where I live. So being in a basement, just it just feels a bit extra secure. As you mentioned before, uh, before we started recording, I'm feeling very Dale Gribble at the moment. <laughs> Oh, I don't blame you whatsoever. It, it, is, it is very much what he would call in one of the early episodes around Y2K. This <laughs> is my time. Exactly. But speaking of it being uh, your time, Paul, people don't listen to AD history to know about what's going on at the moment. They want to know what's going on in the past. So let's speak, uh, talk about something a bit more light in the news. And speaking of your time, happy birthday, Paul. On the day we record this, it is in fact your birthday. So... Big, big happy birthday. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, you know, there's that's the great thing about a March 17th birthday is it's very easy to remember. And I turned 33 today, so, you know, that's a thing. But in fairness, you know, I, I've stopped. After the age of 25, I kind of stopped thinking about my birthday that much. It kind of has, has a tendency to sneak up on me, despite mm. the fact that I love people, you know, texting me and saying happy birthday and all that really does mean a lot to me when you get to a certain point. So at 25, it was kind of the last marker because that was the age that I needed to reach in order to be able to rent a car and it not costing an arm and a leg. And one thing I can say about, especially for people in the United States who, you know, in their case, know that uh, St. Patrick's Day has a tendency uh, for debauchery, and that's definitely true. And I can't even begin to tell you how amazing it was to turn 21 on March 17th when going to college at uh, Loyola Chicago. Uh, Chicago on St. Patrick's Day is famous for many reasons, and though I won't go into a, an, an immense amount of detail, I will give you one great story. That night, and I, I was going out with some friends, and we had a good time. Everyone was safe. There was nothing uncouth, per se, at least certainly nothing that I would share in that regard. But I remember going up to um, a bar on the outside, and there was a bouncer, and of course I was carded. And he goes down and he looks at my driver's license and he looks up at me and he says, oh, that's f***ing dangerous. Let's get you a beer. <laughs> so, you know, that's that's one one of the great stories of my birthday. And it's a great memory to be sure. It but, is. But I'm not the only person who no. has a birthday today, Patrick. No, not at all. So this is kind of a double whammy of AD history. Two of the three voices you hear on a regular basis on AD history share a birthday, and while it might, while this day might share my name, it doesn't share my birthday. It's also Anna Domini's birthday today as well, which is really, it's, what a big old coincidence that is. So happy birthday, Anna. Thank you so much for always being here. She records um, the introduction uh, every time on the podcast, so it's, it's amazing, isn't it, Paul, how, how correct she gets it every time. 
the precision is truly (laughs) mind-blowing. And, you know, you sit back and we think about this in total. We have two St. Patrick's Day birthdays and a Patrick foot. I don't know exactly (laughs) what that means, but I think it's a good thing. It is a very good thing. And speaking of good things, Paul, should we get on with today's episode? Yes, yes, we should. But before we do, two quick items. One, we still are getting a lot of questions about are you guys going to produce an episode more than once a month? Are you really Mm. planning on doing this for 18 years? And so question number two, are we planning on doing this for the 18 years? The answer, of course, is no. We're not doing this until we're well into middle age. Let's let's get that clear right off the bat. (laughs) You know, we that would be strange. To give you guys just a little bit more insight, because we've been kind of, uh, we've mentioned this issue, but not in any real detail. Basically, what Patrick and I need to do is very simple, is from the beginning, our general approach has been that we want the show to be as as solid from both a content perspective and a technical perspective as can possibly be done. So prior to even launching the show, there was an extended a uh, years long process of getting mm-hmm. all the right equipment we needed to do the show the way we felt it needed to be an ad- be done and deserved to be done and you deserve to hear we're coming to a point now where it's not an issue of recording more shows it's an issue of editing them and it may seem like oh well you know it's just two guys on, on two tracks how difficult can it be it, it can be extremely difficult and it's very much a challenge because there's a lot that goes on and I can't even begin to enumerate all of them but the fact of the matter is and this is where the sticking point comes is that because we are not professional editors and producers of audio in particular and we have gained a lot of technical knowledge it still takes a considerable amount of time to do it right and even then you know it's still a learning process for us you know we can hear episode number one and compare it to our most recent episodes and we can see how we've learned and we can see how we've improved. But right now, our job has everything to do with finding a, a proper fit in terms of an editor. And we're going about a few different ways of doing that. However, if anybody here is listening that has any suggestions or even may be interested in contacting and potentially working with us, that's something we are open to. And we're not looking for volunteer work, but we are looking for something that works for both parties uh, so that we can start doing AD history in a way that is is more frequent because it's interesting and you know we have a long way to go so we just wanted you guys to know exactly where we were on that issue because we get asked about it often and you guys deserve to know what we're thinking in a bit more detail so stay tuned for that and we have other things upcoming that may help with that as well but we'll get into to that in detail at another time but the second thing before we go forward let's queue up our traditional and obligatory ad history podcast ground rules one evaluate events in the context they occurred two over the span of recorded history the way it was recorded its methodology and the facts that are important have changed immensely how we view history today is not necessarily how we viewed it 50 years ago three nothing in history was inevitable and four, history and the past is like a different country. So, Patrick, where we're starting today is a very interesting story and an incredibly complex and long range story, to be sure. And that is the arrival of Buddhism in China. Mm. Now, this is a big reason, big deal for many reasons, but ultimately, One cannot understand the story of Buddhism in China unless they understand, in a slightly more detailed way, what exactly is Buddhism. So I think it is best to set the scene. Circa 500 BC, there was a princeling, very likely the son of ruling oligarchs, by the name of Gautama Siddhartha. He was born into what was known as a ruling Shakya clan in a city-state that was located then in what we would consider in the Indian subcontinent, northeast India, probably pretty close to Tibet. He was a young man who wanted for nothing. 
he very much was the height of privilege. Every need, every conceivable possibility or desire that he had was catered to, as you would expect given his birthright and where he was from. But as he got older, he began asking himself a variety of questions regarding the greater nature of existence and their place and our place in the universe. And since he was sh such a sheltered young man, he very seldom knew life outside of that very sheltered court from which he knew no better. For the most part, his dad, being very likely an elected ruling oligarch, very much saw to it Gotama learn the family business of ruling. But in addition to that, shortly before Gautama was born, his mother had a dream that she interpreted as a vision, that her son, who was not yet born, would be one of two things. He'd either be a great political leader, or he'd be a great spiritual leader. And once he began reaching adulthood in his life, he started pondering on these questions further and to explore what he needed to know about the universe and his place within it. He went and he decided to take four trips and in some way to find guidance or example to these questions. It's what Buddhists call the four sites. And on each of these trips, first one was he, he saw the sight of old age. Then on his next trip, he saw the effects of illness. And on the third trip, he saw death for the first time. And on his fourth trip, he happened to encounter an ascetic figure who inspired him to examine all of this in greater detail. And these were the avenues by which Gotama wished to understand the nature and truth of suffering, or dukkha. Because for Buddhists, one of the elemental understandings of truth about the human experience in the universe is that life is suffering. And after an extended exploration on these matters, the likes of which we have just spoken, and I grant you this is very much a summary because this would take days to really go into the proper detail about. After this, he went into an extended meditation continuously over the period of about 40 days or so, a little longer in fact. When he emerged from this continual meditation, legendarily underneath a lotus tree, he is known to have come to four definitive conclusions that Buddhists refer to as the Four Noble Truths. The first is the Dukkha, life is suffering. The second is that suffering is the product of desire or attachments, which is to say, because we want something or desire something, especially something that we cannot obtain or for whatever reason cannot have, is the root of that suffering, and that suffering can be eliminated by eliminating desire. And then, of course, to make this happen for the individual, that they need to follow what is called the Eightfold Path, that is the ultimate guide that Gautama, Gautama being the first known Buddha from which this all originated, is as follows. One, right view. Actions have consequences. Death is not the end, and all actions have consequences beyond this life. So Buddhism has a definite belief in reincarnation. Two, right resolve. Giving up the many earthly pleasures to follow this eightfold path. Three, right speech. Never to cause harm or confrontation by lying speaking ill of, or being unmindful about language towards others. 4. Right action. No stealing. No killing. You get the idea. 5. Right livelihood, which is very simply defined as a profession that does not profit from the suffering of others. 6. Right effort. And that is Unvo avoiding 
unwholesome states, which would seem rather self-explanatory, what is less than wholesome and what's not. And in this case, time hasn't really done too much to understand exactly what that might entail. Mm. Seven, right mindfulness. And that is keeping to the teachings of the Buddha and, and the Four Noble Truths. And then it's eight, which they call as right samadhi, the four stages of meditation. What Gautama describes in the Eightfold Path is described as what is called the middle way that seeks a balance between self-indulgence and self-restraint from const the constant states of wants and desires and the inevitable reality of the fact that you're not going to be able to fulfill all of them. Indeed, sometimes it is fine to restrain yourself from those that you can fulfill. And then, of course, all of which that causes the suffering to begin with. It is taught that in following this path, one can attain the highest level of clarity and existence, enlightenment, a, a, a form of liberation leading to nirvana, which is a state that one can ascend to at the completion of this life, breaking from their personal cycle of reincarnation insofar as having to repeat in one you know one life or another necessary to repeat that is to learn the lessons that you have not learned and that can be a little difficult for people but ultimately it's a form of re it's a form of reincarnation in the belief that through this path you can break from it and you can re reach this higher state that is, in many ways, for all intents and purposes, beyond this world. Mm. And you just mentioned um, enlightenment there as well. Very briefly, you sort of said uh, it, to achieve enlightenment and whatnot. Uh, would you mind enlightening us on what enlightenment actually is in perspective to Buddhists, what that would mean? Because when I hear enlightenment, I tend to think of the enlightenment, uh, which is much later down the road in history. And two very different things, to be mm. sure. Oh, boy. Well, you know, this is a question that it's right up there about with, you know, why are we here? Are we alone? Yes. What happens after we die? How are babies made? <laughs> you know, all that sort of thing. As you mentioned, this is very much a, not even a brief overview, but a not fully in-depth uh, history of the origins of Buddhism, as you mentioned. So... Sorry to throw a big question on you, but now I was just curious to know if you could explain it a bit more to us. So this answer may sound a little cryptic at first, but I think with further contemplation, I think people will have some understanding of what I'm talking about. And I assure you, it is not from first-hand experience. Uh, I'm hardly what one would call enlightened, at least certainly in this case. So I asked this question once many, many moons ago to a teacher that I had who was a Zen Buddhist, who would extol and, and, and talk about Zen Buddhism. And it was a fellow that I maintain a friendship to friendship with, I should say, to this day. And very precociously, I asked him, so what's it like to be enlightened? <laughs> and he said, well, there's an old story. And it goes like this. Before you are enlightened, you chop wood and carry water. After you are enlightened you chop wood and carry water. So what does that mean? It means not much changes. It's, it, yes, it, it, nothing changes, everything changes, is the best way to put it. So you, you still going through your life and, and, and handling matters as, as are needed, but even though so much doesn't change, everything changes. And that's really the best way that I can put it. Interesting. Um, interesting. It, 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 is, it is extremely interesting. And certainly when I asked that question at the time, it's something that took me years to really kind of understand the, the depth of that particular story. But I think that is the best I can do in that regard, which is to say that it's something that is both beyond the current understanding of someone who isn't enlightened, mm. but their existence is not alien to those who have not reached that either. 
So make of that what you will. Hopefully that answers your question somewhat. <laughs> yes, it does answer it somewhat. But um, as you were saying, Paul, you want to talk about uh, Buddhism arriving in China. So uh, of course, uh, yeah, that's what I'd like to hear. That's what I'd like to hear. In in the case of China, China is an absolutely enormous sweep of civilization, and for many Chinese, especially Han Chinese, they they look at their history not in terms of specific governments or political arrangements, but instead it it is something that is beyond that, that takes many incarnations over time, but ultimately have certain unifying um, genetics is the best way I can put it, cultural, political genetics that essentially bind their present, their past, and you know, foreseeably their future as well. China is very much, and I'm not a China hand here, I'm not going to pretend that I am, but China in many ways is a story of many rising and falling dynasties, where usually you have one group that's able to rise up and they, they gain power, they're able to unite China geographically, however the details may change over time, and then it has a tendency then, of course, to descend, and then it fractures. And then from the fractures, it gets built up again into one. It's a reoccurring cycle. And even today, when you're looking at the rule of the, the Chinese Communist Party, certain Chinese you'll talk to, various scholars on China, often look at that as the Chinese Communist Party simply being another dynasty, one that among many that have preceded it. So in Buddhism in particular, its story is very deeply tied to that rising and falling of certain powers over time. And in this case, 64 or 65 AD, about the middle of the 60s decade AD, there was an emperor from the Eastern Han Dynasty known as Ming of Han. And, you know, just to reference back real quick, there's an Eastern and Western dynasty because of an old friend of ours, Patrick Wang Mong. Yes, who very back in the start of this podcast and his, 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 what he did is still, uh, still has implications in the world. About 60 or so years later, 40, 50, 60 years later, what, what he did, we're still seeing the ramifications of it. Yes, absolutely. And and Ming of Han's father was the rest, you know, the restored monarch to uh, the Han Dynasty that created the new Eastern Han Dynasty. Mm. And Ming of Han is an interesting character for a lot of reasons. He is not, you know, he's definitely not a, a some sort of lazy monarch living the best life. Interestingly enough, uh, he was not originally expected to uh, accede to the throne. It was supposed to be uh, a brother of his, but due to a, a change in who the empress was, Ming of Han ultimately ended up being the one who had come to succeed his father. And so he, w Ming was extremely well-educated. He was also extremely interested in religions and philosophy and the world of the mind, the intellect, and trying to attain a greater spiritual understanding of the universe. In addition to that, he was also an extremely capable administrator. So in addition to all of this, he was very good at governing. And interestingly enough, something of a forgiving figure, far more than certain predecessors or successors in that he dealt with uh, a couple of attempted coups by some of his brothers, I think a couple of which may have actually been half-brothers, and uh, he spared them both the first time. They each tried it on separate occasions, but eventually they didn't give up, so he knew what he had to do. Well, around this time, as the story goes, Emperor Ming of Han had an, an incredible dream that he interpreted as a vision where he saw a man that he did not recognize who entered the imperial palace. And when he did that, this man was made entirely of gold, and he had something of an aura around him 
And if I understand and recall correctly, he was sitting directly in the center of the court. And when Ming came to approach him to speak to him, to ask him any sort of questions, this individual rose way up into the air and then flew off, specifically towards the west. When Ming awoke, he brought this to the attention of his closest advisors, and he told them the dream that he had. And one of his advisors told him that there is a, a religion, a practice, right now that's growing in western China of a figure that they call the Buddha. And the stories of him and how he is depicted is that he is depicted as pure gold. Well, this was enough for Ming to say, to send out several envoys to say, go seek out this Buddha. Go seek out those who follow him and bring them back to me. And according to the story, that's exactly what happened. And that some of his envoys got as far as what we consider today modern Afghanistan to find these monks. And when they did, they basically told them why they were being sent and to offer them the opportunity to be the, the beneficiaries of the imperial benefactor, it, specifically of Ming of Han himself. And apparently they followed them back all the way to the imperial capital. And in doing so, they spent an extended period of time with Ming. And during that time, it was the first real hold that Buddhism is said to have taken according to the story. And in this case, while there is undoubtedly a good deal of history in terms of Ming of Han's interest in it, and certainly a great deal of evidence of how he acted upon it, which exists to this day, there is undoubtedly some of the legend in here as well, of course. And that has to be understood. But in many ways, when it comes to history sometimes, it can be just as important understanding the legend in a way that the people who experienced all of this operate upon the legend as it is upon trying to find necessarily all of the concrete, verifiable, empirical, historical facts. I think you understand what I mean by yes, that. Yes, yeah, completely. Because in many ways, if you're trying to understand history in context— and with a prospective fashion as opposed to a retrospective fashion. It's always best to try to, to some degree, to one degree or another, in addition to the empirical, historical, scholarly facts, understand the story as they understood it and acted upon it. And so they did come back with him. And in this case, it started the beginning of a 2,000-year diffusion into greater Chinese culture. And when Ming of Han died in Henan, he decided to, shortly beforehand, I should say, begin construction on the extremely famous White Horse Temple, which for all intents and purposes is the, is the first major monastery that was built in China with, that, with the support of that very powerful imperial benefactor. And in this case, in terms of Buddhism and its time in China, and how I mention how dynasties come and go, Buddhism did not immediately take a, a widespread hold of the country. It was a slow, slow process. And Buddhism itself went through various phases of being in favor to being persecuted. And more often than not, it was usually the product of either a given ruler's personal beliefs, because there was more than a few rulers over the years between now and then who claimed to either be the reincarnation of the first Buddha, Gautama Siddhartha, or their successor, to be sure. And on top of that, when Buddhism was in decline and otherwise being persecuted, more often than not, that was also the product of a ruler who was trying to create some kind of very specific chaos and often went after Buddhism 
because for a lot of reasons, many, but one that's very prominent that you'll see is because they'll still look at it as a teaching of foreign origin, something that is not inherently the product of China, even though over a great period of time, many different types of Buddhism come from its time in China and under the study of many Chinese-born monks. And Buddhism has not always been the greatest cultural fit in China for a lot of reasons. A lot of times in its early existence, certainly over the coming next millennia, first off, it takes about 400 years before they're able to acquire all of the extremely important documents and writings and teaching of Buddhism from the Indian subcontinent and translate it from what is presumably would be Sanskrit into a modern Chinese system, so into the classic characters and language. But a lot of times, a lot of the issues that Buddhism has had in China has had a lot to do with the fact that it hasn't always really jived due to its monastic life. When you're a monk in Buddhism, in many cases, that is very much what you do. What happens in the world outside of you is very much out of your control and outside of your field of interest in many ways. You're not one to be up on the politics of the situation or, or the cultural expectations for social gatherings, that sometimes they could be seen as apart from society, which, depending on the time, hasn't always been the best thing for them. To be sure, it's definitely been harmful, but at other times, it's been extremely well accepted. So that's really the rather strange part about it, and it does go. this does happen over an extended period of time. And ultimately, it finds itself somewhere cuddled in with the other major Chinese teachings, which are, of course, are Confucianism and Taoism. And for the purposes of Buddhism, especially when you're talking about the other two, is Buddhism in particular, and this is true of the particularly educated and higher classes, in, including imperial courts, where in many times, depending on the dynasty, the one will more closely align, say, with Confucianism, then another will more closely align with Taoism. Buddhism, because it's not necessarily viewed as an outright religion, which is difficult to, to explain, but we'll talk more about that later, it had certain appeals to both, really. In the case of Confucianism, there was a, a great interest in it providing an attractive alternative view of the world insofar as its rituals and its discipline if you're a Confucius. And if you're Taoist, there is a considerable value in how it seeks a distinct inner wisdom and that constant striving for a greater understanding of the world and the universe in which we inhabit. And so over time, it has become slowly ingrained for a variety of reasons, some of which I have mentioned. And you look at it, and basically, Buddhism in its time has largely had three major persecutions where simply from banishing monks and destroying temples to outright murdering them. And then you have other times when they're very well cared for. As I said, this happens continuously over the last 2,000 years. In this case, I know that you, Patrick, certainly have some questions at this point. Yeah. So I guess one of the things that shocked me most um, when I first looked into Buddhism, because I've, I've researched a bit of Buddhism myself, out of curiosity, and as you mentioned here, Buddhism didn't originate in China. It's not a Chinese uh, creation. And I think that's crazy, because if you ask most people, uh, where does Buddhism come from? I'm sure a lot of them would say China, because Buddhism is so associated with a uh, Chinese culture, um, but it's Indian. So what I'd really like to know is what actually became of Buddhism in India? Well, it certainly existed for a long time, and it still exists today. Hmm. Um, so the best way I can answer this is that in so many ways, Buddhism and Hinduism in particular, and Hinduism being in so many ways unfathomably ancient. It's the, it's the oldest religion, isn't it, if I'm correct? 
if it isn't the oldest, it's certainly one of the oldest yeah. that we're aware of. Certainly yeah. still in, in current practice, mm, no doubt. Yeah. So starting from within the epoch covered by our show, Buddhism, like in China, has its fortune swept up in a regional and cultural changes over an extended period of time. Many times in those cases, namely with Buddhist monks, they lived and did their work with the benefit of either very wealthy or very powerful benefactors. You know, obviously, sometimes they were very much both. Figures like major rulers or other high-ranking political figures or even the support of wealthy individuals like merchants. Also similar to Buddhism in China, Buddhist orders were not just given material funds. It benefited in numerous other ways. For example, having monasteries built or being uh, given land or something that may even be more familiar to us, receiving uh, tax-exempt statuses on whatever assets they did have and where they were being supported. This is mainly due to the fact that monastic life for a monk is and was an entirely spiritual pursuit. So the patronage was pretty critical in allowing them to continue their way of life, as you might expect. Worldly wealth and material possessions mean little to a Buddhist monk personally. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Beyond its utilitarian role allowing the monks to continue their work, but Buddhism, like in China over the last 2,000 years, has been affected by a number of major events. And here, here are a few examples. For example, Buddhism and its most prominent sects at the time during the Gupta dynasty on the subcontinent between 400 and 600 AD received notable patronage across the board. When prolonged conflicts between the Gupta dynasty and the Hunas, which we know as the Huns, through both the 5th and 6th centuries coincided with the Gupta's decline, Buddhism apparently suffered notable losses. Shuang Song, who is a historically significant Chinese Buddhist monk for his work finding, studying, and translating fundamental Buddhist texts for China, wrote about the devastated temples and, in some cases, monks he witnessed in his travels to the subcontinent during that time, which he personally attributed for all intents and purposes to Hun pillaging during these ongoing conflicts. Buddhism also suffered great loss of life due to the Muslim invasions of the subcontinent between the, you know, the 10th and 16th century, uh, including, but not limited to, once again, uh, lack of benefactors. And insofar as Hinduism and Buddhism are concerned, recognizing that there are numerous such types of both Buddhism and Hinduism, has distinct philosophical and theological genetics common with Hinduism in particular. You know, the first Buddha, the aforementioned Gautama Siddhartha, is viewed as an avatar of Vishnu in Hinduism, which is really quite interesting when you stop and think about it. Each have generally accepted beliefs, like, for example, reincarnation, though there are certainly differing details in terms of how that is understood. And for the most part, they both have similar reservations and uh, issues about the treatment of living creatures. And one of the most obvious ones would be eating meat in general, though neither is necessarily universal in practice. Long story short, it's not hard to conceive how one influences the other in this case. Yet, visa, you know, yet Buddhism vis a vis Hinduism regarding their respective popular appeal and patronage have a direct effect upon one another, especially when Brahmin scholars begin to become more commonly favored by various rulers in the subcontinent around the 11th century. It was somewhat a zero-sum outcome relative to the fortunes of Buddhism. But, you know, there's every reason to believe that Gautama and his family were influenced by for all intents and purposes, Hinduism. What's we saying? Because you think uh, Buddhism and Hinduism are so connected. Perhaps uh, the original Buddha did come from a Hindu family. Perhaps his parents were Hindu, or perhaps he lived in a Hindu town, um, lived in that culture. That explains to us why there are parallels between Buddhism and Hinduism. For most historians, it's a pretty reasonable extrapolation. And from what we can tell, before he went out and embarked to answer the questions that he had that were pressing to him, 
it is generally believed that his family were primarily steeped in the Vedic text. So for all intents and purposes, Hinduism. And something else I was curious about is um, the emperor's dream of the solid gold man who was glowing and he flew away to the west. That sounds so wonderfully uh, fitting. It's such a nice little story. Have we got much evidence on that? Do you, um, do you think that is the true origin of how uh, Buddhism began in China? Do you think that reflects the reality at all? Well, it certainly does have a poetic quality to it. Um, so basically, the way most scholars understand how Buddhism began diffusing into China 2,000 years ago, mm. a lot of that historians believe was actually the product of Silk Road traders which makes a lot of sense because mm. in the case of Buddhism and the various aspects of the story with Ming of Han that, that I told is that it's pretty well understood at this point that Buddhism really began taking root in Western China. And it should be noted, and I'm sure a lot of our listeners do know this, but if you don't, it's still important to know, is that China in the various shapes geographically that it's taken is is far from just the Han Chinese, which is what most people are the people most folks think about when they think about a Chinese person. So even today, uh, it, it said that the PRC recognizes something like 53 ethnic minorities in China. And because of its size, you're getting a lot of different people with differing ideas and, and, and differing backgrounds that change the scope and and complexity entirely. So that's worth pointing out. So they believe it came through Silk Road traders, a lot of which, interestingly enough, apparently were traveling through, and not to reference ourselves again, but the Cushion Empire. Yeah, As you might imagine, of, these sort of things would. We've heard of them before. Yeah, <laughs> yes. And certainly not the last we'll hear of them. No. But in this case, most scholars believe that it was coming through the Silk Road and that it had an organic process of proliferating through Western China. And while the story of Ming of Han certainly is probably based in more than a few kernels of truth, he, you know, based on what we know about him and his actions, that at some point he probably heard about this and wanted to know more and then sent out official emissaries to find those who could bring it back. That, that's, that's part of this that makes sense, especially when you consider, it, consider that he was the one that was responsible for the White Horse Temple. And, and in addition to his other established personal traits, especially as a particularly learned individual who had an incredible knowledge and sought a much greater knowledge about religion, spirituality, metaphysics, things like that, that you would imagine Buddhism was probably right up his alley. Yes, and if there's something I've learned from doing this and from uh, Name Explain when it comes to studying history, and that's if there's a nice, compact really easy to understand story about how something happened it probably isn't true like most of the time that's the case it's oh man a bit it just sets complex. up red flags everywhere yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's like you just you just can't help but but assume you know i hate saying the word skeptic because skeptic is kind of strange but it certainly begins raising a lot of questions that you need answered yeah. very quickly yeah. because history is so seldom if ever that straightforward. I yeah. mean, I suppose it happens, but when it's this long ago and you get a story such as that, you have to stop ask, stop back and ask yourself, well, what else was going on here? Because could this all be just the product of one particular monarch's interest? And how does that fit into the reality of where we know it came from and its potential for getting there? That kind of thing. But even if that story isn't true, it's still amazing uh, to know that was the Silk Road. Like, everything is exported down the Silk Road, including religion. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. The Silk Road brought, uh, you know, to and fro, not just goods and commerce, but ideas and mm. beliefs. Mm. 
and understandings of the universe in, in a way that really, when you stop and think about it, it makes a lot of sense. And, you know, anytime you're dealing with any sort of foreign influence in a country for both positive and, and negative effect, there are many times when it, it is very much the product of a great many different people over an extended period of time coming to that place with their ideas in mind. Not necessarily because they're missionaries or monks, but simply because the people who are doing the hard work in those places and taking those trips, it is, it's almost a, it's something that you can't, it's a historical force that's almost unresistible. Mm. Because people are innately curious. We have questions. We have questions that, based on current circumstances, we can't answer. But you encounter something that is otherwise foreign to your experience that might have an ability to help you seek out and understand the answers that you desire. It's very much part and parcel to the whole human experience. We are innately curious about everything mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so something i'm something i'm curious about myself a uh, nice little segue there uh you said obviously uh buddhism was huge in china or became big in china but there was also a uh, confucianism and a uh, taoism and how does buddhism fit with these other two main teachings in chinese culture well in the case of confucianism and taoism essentially what happened over about 1,500 years from roughly this point at about 65 AD is they became essentially in one respect or another very fused culturally mm. with each other where understanding uh, a given Chinese societies at any point in time before or following where you're ultimately not necessarily finding one without the other. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned to you prior, there have been points in time when Buddhism was particularly appealing to those who practiced Taoism or Confucianism. So there was, from most scholars' perspective, an extended period of fusing between the three of them that led to a, a greater cultural understanding that borrowed from all three, even though all three at one point or another, like I mentioned, were in favor or out of favor for whatever reason in times leading up to that. And it very much has led to, over that extremely long period of time, an outlook for, for many Chinese from that point. It's a little different today for a number of reasons, but that they ultimately come and and complement each other and create a unique cultural product in which the three are are fused and it's not necessarily something anybody would have expected when buddhism first started showing up in china but that's certainly how things apparently have worked out which i think is really really fascinating and you know we see this sort of thing in our own culture patrick mm. you know for you know for whatever reason you know there's we have many religions in each of our countries but there are a number of values and and practices that are not just understood in a definitively religious context but also have a definitive secular importance as well like take christmas for example <laughs> do you you know if, if you're holding if you're if you're holding a christmas gathering christmas day gathering at your home do you only invite people that are christian of course you don't you know of course you don't it, it, it gets viewed and accepted in a variety of different ways you know depending on who your friends are mm. not 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 all of them are necessarily christian but it doesn't mean that they can't enjoy the holiday on some level as you have yes not necessarily yes. for its religious significance but before but for its distinct cultural significance and, and bringing together and yeah. and though it's not one for one in this case this is just an example how this sort of thing yeah. can happen that you know they, they may not be celebrating the birth of christ 
but you, you certainly are celebrating with them on that day, of the special day of the year, certain fellowship, comradeship, and, and just celebration of friendship, as it were. And conversely, even, I guess, on something of a smaller scale, just visiting a site of religions you aren't a part of. Like when I was in uh, Sri Lanka last year, uh, we we visited all kinds of uh, like Hindu temples, Buddhist temples. I don't, yeah, I'm not a follower of those religions, but I'll, I'll still go visit them and be impressed by them. That's for sure. It's the same sort of a uh, idea, I guess. Yes, absolutely. Mm. And you know, religion can be very fluid mm. in many cases, especially in the modern world where now we're exposed to so many different ideas because communication has become so fast and so mm. good that you can be exposed to any number of ideas in any combination that a given individual might feel helps them unlock the answers that they seek. Because there's one thing that we definitely have in common with folks 2,000 years ago at this point that we're talking about that is true now, which is, in many respects, we're all still asking the same questions. Yes. You know, yeah. that's that, that's the truth of it. And in the, in the case of the Chinese, there were many, you know, extremely prominent monks and, and various monasteries and followings over this period that turned certain point, portions and aspects of Buddhism and created a distinctly Chinese product because they... they have a different take on it. and I couldn't possibly cover all of those if I tried yeah. simply just don't have enough hours in the day or days in the calendar to do it but effectively it does begin to fuse into those those that I would even call it trifecta of main avenues of belief and like I said the fact that Buddhism is not necessarily viewed as a religion but merely a, a very specific practice because it doesn't necessarily itself ascribe to a greater deity, I'm sure that helped as well. So, you know, because in theory, depending on the Buddhist, because like I said, there's a great diversity of different types of Buddhism now. You have Zen Buddhism, for example. You have Tibetan Buddhism. It goes on and on. And so, like for example, you can be a Christian and still be Buddhist. It, they don't necessarily conflict. No, I'm sure there are more than a few people that will debate me on that subject or you know, try to behead me, but it's true. And certainly what we're dealing with now, and undoubtedly to one degree or another, that's certainly what has happened over time, and especially in China, where they find this unique product over time that fuses and, and just seems to fit and becomes that distinctly unique Chinese method of understanding certain aspects of existence and answering certain questions indeed and i've just got one last question for yourself paul uh you've mentioned a couple of times now that over the course of chinese history buddhism has played a larger role or a smaller role at various times where does buddhism stand in china today well that's a very loaded question <laughs> um, sorry no 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 nothing to apologize for that's why we're here so for the most part as i said china rising and falling various various dynasties, just like you mentioned. In the case of the current situation, where China is governed by the Chinese Communist Party, the CCP, and the CCP holds all executive, legislative, and judicial and military functions in the country. They are the ruling body, and any sort of governmental mechanism exists beneath them to carry out their edicts, but ultimately they're the power. And it's pretty well understood that most every communist government that has ever been in power always prescribed to an official atheism and to varying success. You know, if you look at, say, the Soviet Union, they always, they were never able to really do away with the various peoples in the Soviet Union and their religious beliefs to the point in which, at some point later on, especially this happened during the war, they allowed Orthodox churches to begin reopening, basically mm -hmm. because they knew they were in a fight to the death and there was a practical response to help their people cope. And ultimately, even though a more atheistic tone came about over time, it never went away. The church was always a huge part 
of the Russian Soviet Federative Republic, which is the biggest republic of the Soviet Union, and its various constituent sub-republics. In the case of China today, Buddhism, like every other religion, has, has had definitive ups and downs where the government has, has pressed those beliefs and oppressed them to varying degrees, because China has this weird thing where it has a tendency to open up some and then close some. There's no great official edict for it happening. It's just kind of an organic process. And in the case of Buddhism, sure, everybody listening is familiar with the history between China ruled by the Chinese Communist Party and that of Tibet, mm. where ultimately they had they ended up invading Tibet. The Dalai Lama ended up fleeing. There was some diplomacy that existed early on where you'll even see pictures of the current Dalai Lama when he was a much younger man sitting down and breaking bread with Mao Zedong to try to come to an amicable arrangement, but this has not happened. And in many cases in modern China, as many people know, religion of various kinds are persecuted. Buddhism being one that's well understood, of course, Christianity's always had a very difficult time there. They have, specifically the Catholic Church and the CCP have a difficult relationship. I know within the last 10 years, I think under the current pope, they did come up with some sort of a system where the Chinese have the ability to sign off on a particular appointment of bishops and archbishops and cardinals. But even that's a very difficult situation. In addition to the fact, of course, we all know what's happening with the Uyghurs in Xinjiang right now. Um, in addition to the fact, of course, you have Falun Gong, which is a spiritual practice that is very heavily based in certain meditative practices and, and exercises, which has undergone a very brutal repression to this day. So Buddhism, for the most part, is not something that is terribly open, especially when it comes to Tibet. And on top of that, there was a lot of very important cultural Buddhist treasures that were lost during the Cultural Revolution as well, mm. when you know, you're going through that better part of a 10-year period when Mao is basically starting revolution again to sweep away the old teachings and, and the old values. And so a lot of those truly important cultural Chinese treasure, treasures, Buddhism included, mm. are destroyed. So Buddhism, like... Every other religion in China right now is experiencing that, that same level of official outright hist hostility. Okay. And okay. it's just the reality of what life is there, like, is like there now. Uh, well, Paul, you've done a, a really good job. Like you said, this is quite a big topic, and you've done a really amazing job at uh, introducing us to how Buddhism took off in China and where it is right now. Um, and I'm sure we will dip back into China between now and then and find out what Buddhism is doing at that time. Yes, absolutely. And as much as I would have liked to go into even greater detail, we simply don't have the time. No, no. Um, just simply because there's it, it covers so much territory mm. and has such a, a nuanced and sometimes less explicit and sometimes more explicit impact on events and its role in the, the greater historical sweep of Chinese civilization. But what's undoubtable is that for all intents and purposes, scholars today know that Buddhism gets its first official notation of record in between 64 and 66 AD, which is a very good marker to begin understanding that this particular civilization is understanding what's coming into their country and and what ultimately they decide to do about that. Yeah, yeah. But of course, we'll we we will be getting into your very interesting stuff right after a word from Anna Domini. Take it away, AD. This is the AD History Podcast. Keep up with the show and join the discussion by following AD History on Twitter with the handle at AD History BC and the hashtag AD History. Check us out over on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube by searching AD History Podcast, as well as, of course, tgnreview.com slash AD History Podcast. Now, back to Paul and Patrick. 
Thank you as always, AD. Now, Patrick, we're going into something of a complimentary segment between this episode and our next regarding the Jewish revolts and the general uprising that occurs and, of course, the all-important destruction of the Second Temple. But in this case, it is something of an interdisciplinary approach that fits into a much wider picture and subject that when you presented it to me initially, I thought it was an incredibly original and interesting way to look at this. So, Patrick, you have the floor. I would like to start my segment today with a uh, personal story, which kind of relates to the topic. So, a few years back, I went to Iceland, the country, obviously. And um, during my stay there, I did all, all, all the tr- classic Icelandic things. You know, I went whale watching, um, played about in the snow, just sort of bummed around a of it. All that sort of good stuff. I didn't go to the Blue Lagoon because I was on my own and I thought just a man on his own sitting in a a steaming sauna might be a bit odd. So I skipped that. Maybe next time I go. However, two of the most noticeable things I did while in uh, Iceland was I saw the Northern Lights and the geysers. I'm not particularly religious, but seeing these dazzling lights in the sky and then seeing like piping hot steam rising from the cracks of the earth. You can start to understand how ancient people, without sort of the scientific knowledge or technology we have today, would have perceived these things, and how ideas of a divine afterlife in the sky and a torturous fireful afterlife within the Earth's core started to form. It it really opened my eyes to that. It it was just incredible. Now, imagine being alive in, say, 60 AD, as uh, where our story begins today, and seeing something like this. How how would you be able to explain it without coming to divine origin? Back then, you wouldn't have the understanding we have now. It would be the only logical answer. And that is what uh, my segment for today is all about. Though it's not about the Northern Lights or the geezers, but something way more out of this world and far more elusive. I'm, of course, talking about comets. So what exactly is a comet? To begin with, when I started researching this, I read them being described as dirty snowballs, which is a really great description because they are primarily made of ice, but they do contain things like rock and carbon dioxide, methane and all that sort of stuff. And they release gas and dust, hence the huge tails we see on them. And they can be absolutely massive comets, despite how small they may look to us. They can be as big as like small towns, they're huge things. And comets orbit the sun at a varying rate. Some are only visible to planet Earth once a century. So it, it takes a while to see them sometimes. And some even believe that comets are the remnants of uh, material formed during the solar system uh, to begin with. And some even think that we came on the back of a comet. Comets brought water to Earth. But that's just a big theory. We're not too sure on that fact. Yes, the old panspermia theory. Mm-hmm. Have you heard the theory, the poop theory as well? Not in so many words. <laughs> Do explain. That's just the idea that uh, the cells that began human existence was um, ejected feces from an alien spacecraft that landed on Earth. It's it's a funny. Douglas Adams was a big Earth fan of it, which makes when you start explaining, it's like, man, that is something right out of Douglas Adams. Mm. Yeah, so I think uh, yeah, I think that's one of his ideas, or he's a big fan of it, but. Anyway, we're not talking about poop today. Uh, what I want to just do quickly as well is bit of, sort out a bit of nomenclature confusion. And that's what is the difference between a comet, a meteor, and an asteroid. So as I mentioned, a comet is made mainly of ice and is massive. A meteoroid is uh, made of rock or metal and originates from a comet. So it's like a bit that's come off a comet and orbits the sun. They are much smaller than comets and they can really vary in size. They can be the size of a grain of sand to like the size of a boulder. So if a meteoroid enters the Earth's atmosphere, but it evaporates, we call it a meteor or shooting star. Uh, however, if it lands on Earth, it's called a meteorite. So that's all that explained. And we have asteroids as well, which are too rock or metal, but they are much bigger. Historically, if it's over 10 meters in size, it's an asteroid. And of course, we know all this thanks to the leaps in science and technology, but these answers weren't available to people of the ancient world. So other ways of explaining comets had to be created to rest their minds. And to the Greeks and the Romans, one word can really be used when it comes to comets, and that's omens. So we've talked about omens in the past and how there were bad omens and good omens, and they were central to their beliefs. A good or bad omen could range from anything to like just some rainfall, 
uh, or even comets in the sky, as we mentioned. And a comet in the sky to Greeks and Romans was believed to symbolize to them that something good or bad was about to happen or is happening as they uh, as they saw it. And a really good example of this comes from 66 AD. A comet was seen across Rome. Um, the histor a historian of the time, Flavius Josephus, wrote of it saying a comet of the kind called Xiphius, because their tails appear to represent the blade of swords, swords, was seen above the city. However, this was not the only thing happening in Rome at the time. 66 AD, the first Jewish revolt started to take place. And um, this, that I've mentioned, this is super important. And Paul, you're going to cover this in way more detail uh, in the next episode. I'm just handling it from this single ang angle because I found it sort of fascinating from here. Oh, yes, absolutely. So the Jewish revolt was the result of years of anger in the Jewish community towards the Romans and the way uh, Jews had been treated. In example, Rome occupied Israel in 63 BC and at around the start of AD, they took over Judea. In Judea, Rome charged high taxes on the Jews and even took over duty of appointing the high priest of Israel, who at the time uh, was the highest official in Judaism. And if that doesn't sound like a big deal to you, let me explain uh, how big a deal of uh, this is. This was uh, later described, I saw one historian describing this as if Mussolini got to pick the Pope in uh, World War II Italy. So it, it would have been a huge deal having your leader chosen by the enemy, basically. Yes, I mean, it's very similar right now in China, how they've commandeered the Panchen Lama, so that way they can determine, because the Panchen Lama is the figure in Tibetan Buddhism mm. that identifies the reincarnated Dalai Lama. Mm. And it's very much involved in their struggle back and forth. So the hypothetical is true. What's happening in this regard in Buddhism mm -hmm. in China is still true. So it's this is a very, very big deal. So it wasn't only this, though. Emperor Caligula declared himself a god in 39 AD and demanded his statue be put up in every temple, including the temples of the Jews. And, of course, the Jews didn't want this as like the whole defining feature of Judaism when it first emerged. What differentiated it from uh, the other religions is that they didn't have multiple gods. They had one single god. So it was absolutely against their religion for all of a sudden Caligula to be a god as well, which, of course, this enraged Caligula that he, uh, the Jews didn't want his statue in their temples. And if it wasn't for Caligula's sudden death, shall we call it, uh, the story of the Jewish race could have gone very different. It, there, there could have been ramifications of it to this very day, but that, that's alternative history. Uh, that, that's not the history we have. What we know for sure is that Caligula's sudden death somewhat saved the Jews, um, and this all led to the formation of the Zealots, the Jewish anti-Roman rebels. And it's easy to see why this revolt started to happen. But what has this comet got to do with the Jewish revolt? Well, if you remember, I said comets were seen as a sign slash omen of something to happen. Uh, this comet was luckily seen as a good omen. It was seen as a sign that Rome would be victorious in all of this in this uh, revolt, and more specifically that uh, Jerusalem would be destroyed and the Jews humiliated at the hands of the Rome, uh, Romans. Uh, was this to be the case? Well, at first the Jews of Jerusalem rioted, and they actually took out a small Roman garrison uh, in the city, and just taking out this smaller uh, garrison really raised the hopes of uh, the Jews. They thought, hey, we can do this, we've taken out one of their garrisons, why not the rest of the empire? Um, did this raise morale? Uh, more, more Jews joined the Zealots movement? Um, and things were really looking up. However, things turned south for the Jews. Um, while they could defeat this one uh, unexpected garrison, heavily armed Roman soldiers came to them and reportedly killed 100,000 Jews, which is a lot, simply. And by 70 AD, Rome uh, breached Jerusalem, and destroyed it, and the important second temple, as you're going to talk about uh, next uh, next episode. This has been described as the final and most devastating blow from Rome against the Jews. And as I said, you're going to cover this again. I want to tackle this comet. What about that comet? Um, so it seems that the com the uh, so it seems that the omen of the comet was true. Rome would destroy Jerusalem and humiliate the Jews. And it wasn't only the Romans who saw this comet either. We have records from ancient China of this comet too. That's how bright and large it would have been. Sources from China even give us a more exact date of its appearance. So uh, these sources from China say it would have been visible from around February 20th until April 10th. 
So it seems that ancient China too would have seen comets as being a sign from the gods, especially uh, really linked in with the whole idea of a mandate from heaven. Obviously, heaven was believed to be up there, so these signs coming from up in the sky um, really links into that. And we talked about the whole mandate from heaven uh, in the very first episode, so if you don't remember that, go back and give it a listen, why don't you? Um, and they, how the Chinese really were fascinated by comets and studied them in great detail. Astronomy was hugely important to them. And we even have manuscripts from ancient China of them recording different kinds of tales they would have seen on comets and meteors and such. And perhaps the most amazing thing is that that exact comet that the Romans saw as a sign of victory almost 2,000 years ago will be visible again in around 2062. So, fingers crossed in our lifetime, Paul, if, if, if everything goes okay. Yeah, so yeah, <laughs> hopefully you and I will be there, but in strong mind and body to behold it, because it showed up only a few short months before I came onto this planet, and mm. I'd remember that about as well as I remember the rest of the Reagan administration and living <laughs> through that period of time. So, fingers crossed, my friend. Mm. So, if you haven't guessed by now... Uh, this comet was the famous Halley's Comet, and of course it wasn't called uh, Halley's Comet when the Romans saw it. Uh, it was named in honour of English astronomer Edmund Halley. It was he who used Newton's idea of gravity to say that three previous comets that were spotted in 1531, 1607 and 1682 were all one and the same, and he predicted it would appear again in 1758. And it did, though however he uh, died in 1742. Um, despite his death, his idea helped shape our modern understanding of comets and gravity. So this elusive comet was named in his honour after its 1758 sighting. Um, it was last seen on Earth in 1986, as you mentioned, Paul. And it should be seen again, as I mentioned, in 2062. And I did some maths. I think I'll be around 67 years old by then. So still got a bit of time to wait. And like I said, it wasn't called Hades Comet to the Romans. And perhaps most interestingly in its long history, this wasn't the only time it was seen as an omen in battle. So this is going way off our, uh, way off our time period now. I just want to go quickly to 1066. And that date will be synonymous with one thing for historians across the world. And that is, of course, with the Battle of Hastings in 1066. Uh, this was King Harold II of England versus uh, William the Conqueror of Normandy. And they battled below this comet. And to the French, this was seen as a good omen, but to the English as a bad one. And of course, this turned out to be true as William of Normandy conquered England and took it as his own. And the comet can even be seen on the famous Bayex Tapestry, which depicts the Battle of 1066 and William's victory. If you just look at the top of it, I'm sure like we can share a picture of it on our social media and whatnot. You will see just 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 the comet up there. That's and I just I just find it crazy how what a, what a reoccurring role that has played throughout history. Like it's the same thing. It kind of reminds me of in Doctor Who, when like there's old historic pictures of the Doctor in like. Like one in Victorian times, one in Roman times, like this singular entity that has just persisted through history. And I just find that, that that's why I wanted to cover this. I just found it so uh, fascinating. Um, however, we won't go into uh, the Battle of 1066 in any more detail because that's still a long way off for us. But that's what I wanted to talk about with a uh, Halley's comet, no, with a uh, Halley's comet, and how the Romans uh, saw it as a symbol that they were going to be victorious against the Jews. And Paul, if you have any questions for me at all, I'd love to hear them. Well, the first question I'm curious about is, though I have my own feelings on the subject. Mm. So the Rome Rome and the Roman Empire and Roman legions, they maintained an exceptionally efficient professional fighting force. And there are many times throughout history, whether it be Roman history or anywhere else in the world, where they look at perceived omens that are the work of the supernatural that portends a specific outcome. Given how professional Roman soldiers were, yet at the same time could also be very superstitious, at least by a modern conception of it, had they viewed this comet and this omen as being potentially a sign of impending destruction, is there any evidence to suggest how this may have changed their military planning or dis decision making relative to the the embroiling and simmering conflict that was happening with the Jews 
So uh, you're basically asking is, uh, would the would would have events turned out differently if this comet was seen as a bad omen, or maybe if it never existed? Well, more 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 specifically, is there any evidence to suggest that it would have affected their military planning? I think is the best question we can ask. Um, I, I, off the top of my head, I wouldn't know. I didn't really find much evidence of omens being bad for Rome. They normally always depicted them as good omens, which is very handy for them, I suppose. But even if it was seen as a bad omen, part of me believes, like, we've been talking about Rome for quite a while now, part of me genuinely believes that if this was seen as a bad omen, the Romans would have been like, okay, let's try really hard so we could prove this bad omen wrong. Kind of like a negative reinforcement, I imagine. <laughs> it would show them, look, go on, that comet saying you can't do it, prove it wrong. And as you mentioned, like Rome were masters in the battlefield. The Roman soldiers were amazing. So I, I, I genuinely think, even though uh, the Jews got the first uh, leg up or were taking out that garrison, I think the uh, end result would have been the same no matter what was in the sky. Well, that brings us kind of the next question here. We can kind of back it up even into a slightly bigger picture. Mm. Are there any other examples of comets or, or any other what would be considered natural omens or signs that were seen as particularly significant in terms of their demonstration before the Roman people that they felt portended future events in one way or another? Are there any other points in relevant Roman history where this most certainly does play a factor. This comet appearing over uh, the Jewish Revolt isn't even the most famous uh, comet in Roman history. And the most fam famous comet in Roman history goes uh, to Caesar's comet, which was seen about four months after Caesar, uh, Julius Caesar's death. I think the Augustus was uh, doing a celebratory games to uh, commemorate Julius Caesar. And in that time, a, a huge meteor was seen above the sky, perhaps one of the biggest, brightest ever recorded in ancient history. And that was perceived as a Caesar's body leaving uh, the planet. And I think some even saw this as him being, being uh, deified. And of course, Augustus saw this as a good omen that Caesar was happy with him for taking over. And I think that very much, uh, if any of the Ro Romans were angry about Caesar's death, this calmed their nerves. See, that's, that's incredibly interesting stuff. It could have been, it, we could if, if it happened a bit sooner, it definitely could have been an uh, episode unto itself. Yes, without a doubt. Now, because of the nature of how astronomical phenomenon have played a fantastic role in the rise of human civilization, not just in terms of religion or prophecy or portending the future and prophecy and portending the future, two different things, just as a as a note to our audience, prophecy is a case where there's an interpretation of God's will, whereas portending the future is is something different that's trying to achieve clairvoyance. So that's something that's a common misconception that I think it's important to make a distinction here. Now, in terms of civilizations across the world, given that we are world history, how did other major civilizations choose to interpret these sort of signs what significance do they have like for example you were talking about china a little earlier It'd be great if you went into a little bit more detail on that or even even someone that's a bit more further afield compared to what we've covered so far say as in mesoamerica mm, so uh it's a very good question i think a lot of the world despite uh being so separated uh in some aspects a lot of the world and a lot of these ancient uh, tribes very much consider comets one and the same. Um, we have records from uh, the Arab world even that uh, comets were a good omen of something that was going to happen. And as you mentioned specifically with uh, Mesoamerica, in Mesoamerica uh, it, there were reports that a meteorite was seen above the skies of Mesoamerica shortly before uh, Cortez came. And we know what he did to... Uh, in, in South America and what a, what, what a figure he was and as we were mentioning uh, off off Mike Paul that, that's something we're going to be interesting to uh, study as when, when, when we get to it oh yeah oh yeah it's all 1500 years from now mm -hmm. we've got a little bit more time to prep for it <laughs> yeah 
Well, something that was interesting is when, when I heard you going into astronomical phenomena, and I was looking into it outside of the prophecy and, and portending future events. And what I find really fascinating is that for the most part, when we look at the history of ancient tracking of astronomical phenomena, we keep coming across two reoccurring figures, one of which you've mentioned already, which is China, and the other are the many rising and falling civilizations of the Arabian Peninsula mm. and the Middle East. And though some people may be familiar with this, but we, we can't assume everybody is, that most of the time, a lot of what we know today is certainly out of the, the Western heritage of astronomy and tracking astronomical phenomena, a lot of which played into the everyday simply because they were using it, and in many cases quite accurately, for the sake of building very applicable and very accurate calendars. Because mm. naturally what they would do going back thousands of years now, it's really quite incredible the work they did. And when you start really sitting down and you look at these ancient star charts and you realize in the big sweep of the history of the universe, what is a few thousand years in this case, right? It's, it's just like the smallest drop in the bucket. You begin realizing that they're doing it for calendars, but specifically it has a very specific tie-in in regards to how humanity, especially in places where water is not always the most available, especially fresh water, and you're dealing with large growing populations, a lot of this and a lot of this study was so often based on the necessity of getting a really accurate calendar for the purposes of improving their methods of agriculture, mm -hmm. which is really an incredible thing when you stop and you think about it. And oh, yeah. in the case of Halley's Comet in particular, it's also incredible because they're in the sky, of course, they're tracking the rising and falling of certain constellations that are visible and certain planets that are visible for a certain portion of the year. And they're doing all of this without, for the most part, from our perspective today, without the, the formalized benefit of something like Newtonian physics, where you can you can predict based on classical physics where something will appear in the sky at what time and what place and do it with a, a phenomenal amount of accuracy, which is really quite incredible when you stop and you think about the fact that, you know, a lot of these, a lot of these things were done without the kind of incredibly advanced tools right now. We, you know, we're sitting on the precipice of launching finally the James Webb telescope. Mm. And these folks, going back even a few thousand years, had absolutely rudimentary tools by comparison, and it is absolutely something to wonder at, is it not? I, I genuinely think, Paul, we could do a whole separate uh, podcast just explaining how people got shit done in the past. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. It's 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 really an amazing subject. Just how much humanity has managed to accomplish with relatively so little from which to work. I mean, mm. you know, th th they say that necessity is the mother of invention, and goodness gracious, if this isn't a perfect example of just that, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, it's really quite incredible, especially as you mentioned how um. This was often done in places with uh, not as much uh, access to water, and the Arabian Peninsula is the best example of that. I'm, I'm amazed at how much got done in uh, the Arabian Peninsula. Like, you know, that that that's considered by many to be where civilization started, and all in the middle of like a desert. It's just, it's incredible. No, and it is very, it is very much one of the truly astounding cradles of civilization. Now, relative to the Jews themselves, bringing it back to roughly 66 AD when this first starts cropping up. We mentioned how the Jews initially luck out because, for the most part, they're able to take out a small garrison. Mm. And, of course, 
They were also fortunate about a decade before that. They and the Praetorian Guard for a short period of time had a common interest, which is to yes. say a common enemy, yeah. and they and they did away with Caligula. And we talk uh, so much more uh, about that in our a couple episodes ago when yes, we, we yeah, talk we about the the aggrandizement and uh, the the incredible narcissism at the very least that that we know of insofar as is possible given how the history was written in a very specific way regarding Caligula and his surviving enemies in this case something that is important to keep in mind is as we're moving forward here the Jews in particular are fortunate in one way in particular, which is that when you see the death of Claudius, which happens in this decade, it creates an extreme uh, shifting in regards to who's in charge of the Roman legions that are preparing to take out the Jewish revolt. Um, you start off with Vespasian and then, of course, naturally, you go through that very quick uh, period of the four emperors where three of them die. And next thing you know, you had at the beginning of all of this, you have Vespasian, who is in charge. And then at the end of it, he's in charge of the entire scene back in Rome. And the thing that's truly amazing, especially considering this, this episode in this segment very much dovetails into 70 AD, which is... Yes, and, you know they're very much connected for obvious reasons because the Romans destroy the temple, but we're kind of coming into an interesting place where, as historians, we can we can stop and say to ourselves, with the destruction of the second temple that we've talked ad nauseum about here on the show <laughs> yeah. so far, like if you've if you've learned one thing from listening to AD history, it's the, that important of the the importance of that second temple. Mm. Well, the thing that is particularly fascinating there is that we as historians get to say something that get to make a grand sweeping statement that so few historians truly get to make, which is that with the destruction of the second temple in 70 AD to where the Jewish rebellion is quashed and it begins the Jewish diaspora that literally starts with the Roman destruction of the second temple and only concludes in in reality mm. with the uh, formal establishment of the modern state of Israel concurrent with the Truman administration. There are not many grand sweeping statements about history that many historians will get to make <laughs> to that end. No, and so it's no. really kind of incredible to stop and think about just how much um, – in so many ways, and, and just how this 2,000-year epoch of history is bracketed, that you have these two very, very separated in time events that are inextricably linked in a way that very much sets a stage for so much of what is going to follow, stuff that's more obvious in regards to how it plays its own hand in and how the, the Jewish diaspora is ultimately diffused throughout the ancient world, whether it be into Europe, whether it be further into North Africa, or it be East. And then, of course, having it all come back together once again through so many events we're familiar with now, and so many we're going to get to learn along the way. Yes, and that's the exciting thing about all this. Yes, it is truly an absolutely stellar and mind-blowing junction of history that is just entirely fascinating in every single respect. And uh, is there anything else you want to add here, Patrick? Nothing in particular I would uh, like to add. I just, uh, like I said, I just find it so uh, fascinating how these sort of comets, they'll forever be persistent in, um, in history. You know, it's, they're not going anywhere. And each time Hayley's Comet is present, it, that will be a a part of its history. You know, that new stories will, will revolve around it as it did in 1066. As it did in 66, it won't ever end. Even when after this podcast ends and we're gone, Hayley's Comet will still be there making more history. Yes, yes, it will. And in fact, if anybody's interested on in this topic, so Hayley's Comet shows up about every 75 years. And the last time it was here, it was not a great viewing period, but... Two things. One is the Soviets, um, I believe it was in conjunction 
with a mission that they were launching um, regarding Venus at the time actually sent a probe that tracked Halley's Comet at relatively close range for a time. Mm -hmm. So that's something we'll definitely share out on social media because this thing has been so prevalent in human history that by the time we had the opportunity to try and see this thing up close, we took it. And the other really interesting thing is if you're interested in where Halley's Comet is right now, you better believe we're tracking that too. Mm. Um, it's just getting to the point now where we're getting almost at that halfway mark where right now it's on the way far end of the solar system. It's not particularly near anything at the moment. I think it's just beyond what the, if I remember correctly, the the orbit of Pluto is around our star and it's just getting ready in the next few years to become come rocketing back towards us. And then unlike 1986, where the sun apparently got in the way of viewing Halley's Comet from Earth quite a bit, this next one, should you and I be lucky enough to see it, along with all of our amazing listeners, mm. this time around, we're going to get a truly stellar up close and personal look at this thing in a way that hasn't been possible from Earth for well over 150 years at that point. And you can bet we will still be making podcasts talking about the years uh, 20, 20, 2051 to 2060. You can bet we'll still be there. Cheers to that, Patrick. I hope we are alive and well to enjoy it both. You were listening to the AD History Podcast. Anyway, I think that brings us to the end of our journey for today. Patrick, where can people find us? You can find me personally on Twitter at NameExplainYT, and of course you can find me on my YouTube channel, NameExplain. And for myself, you can find me on my newly minted Twitter account at the handle at History, as well as on the social media news platform Quartz by searching Paul K. DeCostanzo. Also, take a peek at my reader email submitted Q&A column, the World War II Brain Bucket over on TGNR. We have a link down in the description. If you enjoy AD history and you want to support the show, be sure to leave a glowing five-star review. Or if you're on YouTube, like, share, and subscribe. AD history really does depend on listeners like you leaving reviews and ratings to help support it. Now over to Anna to properly send you guys home. Thank you for listening and goodbye. Yes, thank you for listening. Be well. Until next time. Like all good things, we come to an end for today. Thank you for listening to the AD History Podcast. It is listeners such as yourself who make this show possible and truly awesome. Be sure to follow and subscribe for upcoming AD History Podcast episodes, available wherever podcasts are found. Also, follow AD History on social media. Follow the show on Twitter at the handle at AD History PC, as well as on Facebook by visiting facebook.com slash AD History Podcast and Instagram as AD History Podcast. In addition to liking and subscribing on YouTube by searching AD History Podcast. Easy, really. <laughs> I'm sorry, these witty... Oh, you can cut these witty comments. Do you have a direct comment or question for Paul and Patrick? Drop them an email at adhistorypodcast at tgnreview.com. Also, be sure to visit the show's homepage at tgnreview.com slash adhistorypodcast. On behalf of Paul and Patrick, thank you for listening to the AD History Podcast. We will see you again next time in the ever-growing tapestry of world history.